This is Fit to Succeed in partnership with NordicFitnessEducation.com with host Ben Pratt. What I've seen is that, and, and we can compare diets, we can talk about keto, we can talk about fasting, we can talk about Atkins and low carb and high carb or mixed meals, that the macronutrient ratios aren't going to have a significant effect on whether you're losing fat or gaining muscle. Welcome to this episode of the Fit to Succeed podcast. I am Ben Pratt, your host, and I am very pleased today to welcome to our podcast a seasoned strength and conditioning coach, as well as the current performance nutrition coordinator for the big global educator, Precision Nutrition. His name today is Adam Feet. Adam, how are you doing? Good, Ben. How are you today? I'm really good, and uh, it's wonderful to, to have a few minutes to talk with you as a seasoned strength conditioning coach, someone who's done a lot of work in behavioral change. I'm keen to kind of tease out some of your expertise today. Yeah, very much looking forward to the opportunity to, to speak with you and to obviously you know, impact the industry as much as we can. I think we have a, a unique opportunity ahead of us, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Great stuff. Now, just before the call, we were talking, and you mentioned you've been aligned and working with Precision Nutrition for almost 10 years uh, and we're, we're taken on by them as a full-time or as an employee back in 2014. Now, in relation to that, obviously nutrition is a big part of everything you do with athletes and coaching. Um, how would you rank the role of diet and nutrition in the achievement of physical performance goals and why? Yeah, so I think like anything, and as we were discussing in terms of, you know, how important is it? I really look at it in terms of what other dimensions are part of this process, right? So, you know, as you alluded to earlier, working, you know, almost 15 years in strength conditioning and, and aligning myself with precision nutrition, we really look at how big of a spoke on the wheel is this, but also what are all the other spokes? And so, you know, we know, and we can talk about this later, uh, exercise by itself is probably not enough. We, mm -hmm. We've seen some research on that. And obviously we're trying to create great habits to help our clients, you know, work on their daily skills and practices so they can get closer to those goals. But I also just want to, to point out that nutrition is a, a very big piece, especially in regards to athletic performance because of what is going to happen, how that's going to facilitate recovery, how is that going to hamper recovery, how is that going to drive the adaptations, let's say if it's in the gym or on the field. And so it's a, it's a very large role in terms of physical performance. But also, what, you know, what else is part of it? So if we're, if we're going to performance, let's say it's an athletic event, you know, how is their physical preparation, right? How is their strength conditioning? How is their mental preparation, right? Mm -hmm. What are some other dimensions of the support that they have from the psychosocial model to all of the different pieces involved in driving them towards that ultimate goal? So to kind of answer the question and sum it up, it's, it's a very large piece, but we also can't uh, neglect all of the other important pieces of this wheel of athletic excellence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. I think that's a, that's a, a nice balanced answer. I wonder though, if you were to kind of, you know, put your finger in the air and, and estimate a percentage of the importance of achieving, you know, the ultimate goals of physical performance, what percentage would you rate nutrition as being in your opinion? What does it look like? Let, let's do a case study if we can, Ben. What, what type of athlete? Are we working with an athlete? Are we working with a general population client? Could you give me some context here? Yeah, so let's say we're working with an athlete, maybe somebody who's a, a basketball player, for example. Okay. I would probably say at this point for, for that type of individual, I feel very conservative about, let's say, a 30% ratio of, of importance. So because you know, if we're looking at, let's say, the spirit, mind, and body, and we're looking at technical preparation, we're looking at physical preparation, we're looking at mental preparation. I think if we keep it a nice even square of the pie, so to speak, of you know 30 plus percent, uh, it's a good starting point. But as we know in nutrition coaching and any type of coaching, uh, that's gonna adapt and it's going to change over time. So we can start there and let's say, you know, if it's a, a weight class athlete, for instance, or somebody that's gotta make weight for a certain event, obviously the, the importance of nutrition is gonna go up uh, mm -hmm. remarkably because of the importance on that. Mm -hmm. Now that actually leads us nicely into my next thought, and that is uh, I'm well aware that Precision Nutrition have stated for some time that there is research out there to indicate that exercise as a standalone method for weight management is actually not very effective. And you, you kind of talked there about athletes who need to make weight. Uh, can you elaborate perhaps on this concept that exercise alone might not actually help the athlete make weight? 
Yeah, so it's interesting what we've seen in the research and through our own experiences with our clients. So, you know, we've been very fortunate at Precision Nutrition, you know, over the last 15 plus years to work with over 100,000 clients, help certify and coach 70,000 plus, you know, nutrition coaches, personal trainers and strength condition coaches. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, you know, eat less and do more. I think is a good starting point, but it doesn't answer all the questions and it doesn't take in consideration all of the variables that happen. And so, you know, in one side of the nutrition and diet camp, you have this idea of let's just eat less and do more because we want to simplify it to it's simply just calories in versus calories out. Now, it's not that simple. And while we can kind of deduce it down to, you know, we have to do more output, we have to take in less input there are a lot of variables at play here. And so when we discuss this with our clients, when we discuss this with our coaches, you know, we want to bring up the issues that they may see. So for instance, a common one that we see a lot in the industry is, you know, hey, let's just start off with a food log, right? And so right away, we are now asking our clients to track what they're eating, how much they're eating, maybe why they are eating, what else is going around. But we do know through the research that we grossly underestimate, our clients grossly underestimate how much they're really eating. And so now this becomes an issue for the information that I get from the client. How is that going to drive my future coaching behavior? So, you know, I'll start there in terms of underestimation. We also know that despite the advancements in technology and the availability of um, wearable technology, whether it's a watch, whether it's an app, whether it's a program, uh, we have a tendency of overestimating exactly the, the calories burned from exercise. Mm -hmm. So now you have on one hand, you, you're underestimating how much you're eating. And then on the other hand, you're overestimating how much activity you're doing. That, be, that be creates this conundrum of, well, how come I'm not losing fat, right? Or how come I'm not gaining muscle? And so we really want to bring light to that because to anybody that is going to cause some behavior change in their own life, they're not going to see and understand why. So I think that's why it's very important for coaches to remember, hey, it's not always as simple as eat less and do more. There are a lot of other variables that come in. And I think another one that comes in too, we talk about, especially with athletes, and, and I've gone through this working with the athletes, whether it's at the university level, the college level, when I was running my own facility and, and now finishing up school, is this idea of hedonic compensation. We know food makes us feel good. We associate food with feelings. We associate foods with family. We associate foods with experiences. And something that we try to get our clients and coaches to remember is that we don't eat macros. We don't eat protein and carbs and fats. We eat meals. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just a cup of this or eight ounces of this or 42 grams of that. And so when we look at that and we associate the feelings with food, uh, if we're depriving that pleasure that we get from food, we're going to look for it somewhere else. And what we've seen is actually that people that are going to exercise more, for instance, they're going to make statements like, well, I had a really hard workout, so I deserve insert fun, amazingly tasting, highly processed food here that's loaded with calories. Absolutely. Right. And so it creates this, this dichotomy of where they're working so incredibly hard, but now there's this idea that they deserve extra calories. Mm -hmm. And so you throw in that. But if I could interject there, I, I sure, actually go ahead. have an experience of that myself where I was uh, going to a, a national level uh, athletic uh, location and I had the opportunity to speak to a bunch of personal trainers. And one of the people who attended was actually in charge of feeding the athletes who worked at this location. And uh, he, he, mentioned during the, the course of the, of the training that one of the biggest challenges he had was at nighttime, because they, they managed all of the athletes' meals, you know, the, mm -hmm. the intake throughout the day, they fed them all and kept them on track with what they were supposed to eat. But at nighttime, when training was finished and they were relaxing in their dorms, that one of the biggest challenges that they had was to stop them ordering takeout or sneaking out to, to a local place because they were, you know, still essentially very hungry and uh, still had this drive to want to eat food that was enjoyable. So, uh, so I, I can relate to that completely. Yeah, and that's, that's something that we continue to see to this day, you know, as the, the popularity of registered dietitians and nutrition coaches being hired at high performance programs like that, you're, you're never going to be able to completely control it, right? You know, you, we, ha we have, I, I just finished my statistics class in school, and as much as we try and control it in that specific setting, great but that doesn't mean it's going to work in the real world. And I think that's an important, important piece to, to discuss with coaches. So, you know, to wrap that area up, there's a lot more variables, uh, the effect of hormones, the effect of stress, the effect of the supportive environment or the lack of support. And mm -hmm. so when a, when a coach can look at all of the different 
avenues contributing towards weight loss or weight gain, uh, it's going to open up a great opportunity to have that breakthrough moment with the client uh, for the coach itself, because you can work out more, it may cause you to eat more, you're going to be eating more highly processed foods. So now more of the calories are being absorbed. And you're going to be decreasing, let's say, physical activity that you might be getting outside uh, from, you know, maybe walking a little bit more after meals. So it, there's a lot to consider. I wish we could make it as simple as just eat less and do more, but it, it simply doesn't work like that. Yeah, well, I, I would completely concur. You know, so often we look at the calorie balance and just believe it's about a deficit. But like you say, what is driving people's calorie intake? Uh, and there's so many other factors behind that exactly as you just alluded to there. Now, go ahead. Well, I, and one, I was just thinking about one point that we often we're relying on information that is, is user driven, right? So especially with popular diet apps and tracking apps that we know, for instance, you know, upstairs, I've, I have a bag of potatoes, right? Uh, my wife and I got an air fryer for a recent holiday and a healthier option if we want to make French fries, for instance, or uh, chicken nuggets for our kids, whatever it may be. And I'm looking at the bag of potatoes and it could say one medium potato. And then I'll have some grams listed for that. But a client uh, is probably not going to have that weight scale, right? So they're going to grab that one, what they think is a medium potato, and mm -hmm. they're going to get a caloric total for that. But what is medium, right? If they don't have a scale, that medium, I'm looking at the bag of potatoes and I'm thinking there are a lot of different shapes of potatoes here. So then they start bargaining with themselves. Well, this is a small potato. So that's equal to two small is equal to one medium. And mm -hmm. so I think to go back to the equivalence of what's happening on the nutrition facts, there is a lot of error on that, whether that's on the label itself or what people are gathering their information from. So I, I'd, I'd be remiss not to mention that because we're, we're getting our information from so many other resources other than one specific place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point, uh, particularly with portion control and portion sizes. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the legal requirements are right in the US, but I know here in the UK, um, the law allows, even on the back of a nutrition table, it allows a 20% margin of error, plus or minus, on a, on a food product. So if you're looking at that and it says 300 calories, well, the reality is it could be quite a bit above or below that amount. So I, I don't know if there's a similar scenario in the U.S. or not. Yeah, well, and it just, it just it adds up over time, right? So you, so you take your 300 calories, right? So, you know, that's essentially going to be 240 calories or 360. Mm -hmm. And if you do that for every food item and every meal, and if you're eating four to six times a day over the course of a week, it is no surprise. Like, why am I not losing fat? Why do I not feel better? So uh, the better restrictions and regulations we can have on that. Uh, would be great, but we also, you know, have to work in the confines of, of real living and what's going to happen at hotels, what's going to happen on the road, what's going to happen in school, right? I've, I've got two small children that, and we're having a discussion at PN right now about uh, the quality of school lunches, right? There's a, there's a lot of things to consider here. So I think when you bring it back up, it's take, taking a critical lens at everything that could be impacting it. Okay. And if we, if we take that critical lens, uh, Adam, and, and think about the most common way I've seen that, that most personal trainers tend to provide nutritional advice. And I wonder if this is the same in the strength conditioning community, but is we tend to focus on meals and providing recipes and meal ideas. Mm -hmm. And then we also focus on macronutrient percentage. They tend to be, in my experience, the two big rocks that are dealt with first before we start getting into you know, nutritional sufficiency. Now, in, in your experience, uh, you know, have you seen that those are the drivers? And, and what would be your position on using meal plans and macros as your guidance tool? Yeah, so we still see that, especially on, on this side of the world, because that's been the norm. That's been the tradition of you need a diet. And so I'm going to give you something based off some formula that's going to predict how many calories you need per day based on activity levels and, and whatnot. But I always go back to what is going to be the, the number one predictor of success for any type of diet plan. And we know that that is consistency. We know through the research, the position stands that come out through the, the, through the journals, even the medical journal, right? There was a study done in the Journal of American uh, Medical Association on prescription medication. Mm -hmm. And less than half of the people that were given a prescription that would make a remarkable difference in their health took it consistently. So now we're, we're not talking about, hey, I want to feel a little bit better in my genes, or I wish you know, I could get a little bit better sleep and nutrition. We're talking about medicine. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we can't uh, uh, elicit that through medicine, through the medical model, how can we do that through food? And so macros, you know, if we're, if we're talking carbs and fats and proteins and understanding where our clients are in their journey, it may be exactly what they think they want. It does not mean it's exactly what they will actually do. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And if you have somebody that has very limited nutrition know-how, again, I, I remember working with kids. I remember working with a family that uh, were parents of a high school athlete and they would buy a, a sugar sweetened cereal like Lucky Charms. And in their eyes, they thought it was healthy because it said high in fiber, mm -hmm. right? We see the, you know, again, now we're battling advertisements in the food industry and whatnot. But to go back to, to the macro question, it, it's, it could be a starting point. But what we have found is it's often too high on the nutritional competence level because now instead of saying hey could we eat more whole unprocessed foods could we drink a little bit more water could we eat to let's say 80 percent full could we eat a little bit slower these are all easier ways through proper skill development that we can control calories that we can elicit the changes that that client wants we are now asking them to do math we are now asking them to measure things out we are now asking them to do more and more things that might be out of the norm of their regular life. And so I don't know how you travel, Ben, but like I travel frequently for PN. I don't bring a food scale. I don't bring my Tupperware. I'm not getting my meal shipped to the hotel in advance. And if I'm sitting at a big dinner at an event, I'm not making all of the changes to, to fit my lifestyle right then and there. I'm going to do the best I can with what I have where I am. Mm -hmm. And I think as an industry, we just want to push towards these absolutes. We want to push towards this numbers-based approach. Uh, but in reality, I think what we have seen working with our clients, it's too much, it's too soon, and mm -hmm. it's too hard. And so, so are you suggesting that, that uh, it's, it's more effective to take a more uh, a simple, overarching view, uh, a principles-based approach, rather than getting into those kind of smaller details like macros and micronutrients and those kind of things? Right. And, 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 there, and there's a value for that, right? So if we're, if we're working with a high level athlete, for instance, a weight class board or somebody that gets paid, you know, we call them like higher level two and level three clients, mm -hmm. they're, they're getting paid to look and feel and perform a certain way, 100%. But we also are under consideration that they probably have the money for things like meal delivery services. Maybe they have a private chef and maybe their coaching style is coach, just tell me what to do, how much to eat, and I will get it done. Mm -hmm. And history shows us that they will. I ask the personal trainers, I ask the nutrition coaches out there, who are your primary clientele and what are the confines, what are the log jams uh, in their processes now? And so we might recommend a meal plan and we might say, hey, for us at PN, let's start with one to two palms of protein. Let's start with one to two cup handfuls of, of smart carbs. Let's start with one to two thumbs of healthy fats and let's try to get one to two fists of high you know, nutrient producing vegetables. Let's start there and then let's adapt as needed. So now not only do we give our clients the autonomy to choose, hey, well, what can I have for lean protein? That could be chicken, that could be steak, that could be uh, tofu, that could be salmon. What can I have for carbohydrates? And we give them these options, but we also do not wanna make it so restrictive that now it becomes a all or nothing process. It rather becomes an always something. And mm -hmm. so we're always inching to do a little bit better as we move forward through that. And so. What I've seen is that, and, and we can compare diets, we can talk about keto, we can talk about fasting, we can talk about Atkins and low carb and high carb or mixed meals, that the macronutrient ratios aren't going to have a significant effect on whether you're losing fat or gaining muscle. Sure, at the higher levels, will they dictate how you feel and how you perform and, and what your body might look like? 100% in terms of there can be some unique strategies we can do there. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the overall balance, hey, can we get some consistency down? And can we make sure that they have a choice and this is doable in the realities of their own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that. You're sort of taking a longer term approach, helping them develop habits rather than, like you suggested, you know, fixing themselves to a specific diet that might have a lifespan that they struggle to adhere to. It kind of leads us nicely into the concept though, because you mentioned there about, you know, finding the log jams, finding the, the, the things that might be a problem. And it makes me wonder then, how do you determine what are the big rocks that a client or an athlete would need to prioritize? How do you decide what those big rocks are when you're working with someone towards their dietary or exercise goals? I, I, think, that, I think that's a great question and something that we encourage immensely at PN is, is take the time to listen to what your clients are saying and also what your clients are not saying. Every single one of them have a reason for why they're going to be working with you. And I think if we take the actual time to ask them a little bit deeper, maybe a little bit more frequent of, hey, why is this goal important to you, right? Uh, naturally, they're going to give us some very surface level response because I want to feel better. I want to look better. I want to lose it's something. But if we can dig a little bit deeper and we can be patient with that process, we're going to find something that is uh, instinctively, intrinsically motivating them 
for this process to begin. And so I always yes. encourage- What sort of things? Give us some examples for the listeners of things that you're getting at. Sure. So uh, let's say a common example is somebody comes to you, let's say they're uh, middle age and they've got a reunion coming up. So maybe it's uh, a college reunion, high school reunion, et cetera. And maybe they say, you know, I want to look good for my 10 year reunion, for instance, or 20 year reunion. And so as a coach, you know, we adapt the technique called the five whys where, you know, okay, well, why, why is this important to you? And then they build on that goal prior. So maybe the person goes to, I want to lose 10 pounds for my high school reunion. You say, well, why is losing 10 pounds important for your high school reunion? And then they answer that with, uh, I want to feel good about myself in front of others that I haven't seen in years. And then you continually, you know, ask a little bit more and a little bit more. It may take three whys. It may take six take six wise. Uh, and it may not happen that day, but eventually you might get to a point where you realize that at the end of that session, you now have a deep reason such as I was bullied in high school or essentially I lost a, a long-term relationship and, or I'm in a current relationship that is not healthy and I want to feel comfortable. I want to feel confident in my own skin mm -hmm. with people that I have not seen in many years. Yeah, and and that, that, that might be an, an extravagant example, but any, anybody will say they want it to look better and feel better, but what is their why? How, what are we gonna ask and how are they gonna be able to anchor that accordingly? And so we, we wanna take the time to do that, but more importantly, we wanna spend time understanding all of the dynamics of this coaching relationship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what type of support do they have? What type of support do they not have? They can come into our office and say, hey, I want to go ahead and lose all this fat, but what does that look like? How close are you to a grocery store? What type of skills do you have or not have in the kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, are you working a nine to five and then a five to nine, right? So these are some things that we want to understand and, and really, you know, get inquisitive. Like let's use prior data and experience that they're willing to give us. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take time to determine where to begin. Because I also think a lot of us start, we have this template and we just start here. And it doesn't matter if, if they're experienced in nutrition, doesn't matter if they're a single parent, doesn't matter if they're a CEO, mm -hmm. we start there. And that, that can also be a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And so taking the time to sit back, really front load the process of understanding what have you done thus far, right? Uh, something that we talk about all the time is, is solutions focused coaching. Uh, tell us about a time that you were successful, right? Uh, tell us about a time where you were able to successfully lose fat and keep it off for X amount of time. What were those things that you did? How can we do more of that? Uh, where do you find these issues that you're having struggles with? Because I think as coaches, we're constantly looking for all the wrong things. Let's look for the things that they are now. So back to the log jam. Hey, what were the things that you helped unhinge that log before? And let's figure out how we can make that now. Maybe that was easier before kids, but I think we can still find it uh, with kids and with a job and going back to school and whatnot. So all in all, it comes down to not rushing to fix because there's nothing wrong. There just needs to be a little bit more clarity in how we approach the, the coaching relationship. And that starts at the beginning. Yeah, I, re I really like that solutions focused coaching approach because I think so often uh, as a trainer, as a coach, we think that the, we need to identify faults and errors in order to justify why they need us. And it's more about us pointing out, look at these things you've got wrong. You're going to need me and you'll have to pay me in order to put those things right. Whereas if you do the solutions focused approach, as you've identified, it actually is more beneficial to us because it helps us identify the ways in which the client has historically been successful that are probably more likely to support them as they move forward now. Would, would yeah. and, 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 and right there, it's, 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 it's the power of language, right? We're, we're simply reframing what the client wants and what we want as a coach. And so, and I challenge coaches all the time. I see in diet plans and meal plans and handouts, you know, somebody that let's say they, they want to lose weight. So they're going to write things like avoid this, limit this, stop this, you know, remove that. And so right away you're thinking, yeah, this, this looks really fun. These are all the things I can't do. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we simply reframe that into consider this, try this, aim for that. Now it, it gives them the, the process of like, Ooh, this, this could be fun. And this is something that I haven't done yet. And it's removing the whole idea of, Oh, these are all the things I can't do. So yeah, let's see how this works out. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you on that 100%. Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I, I know I've used before with clients is I've uh, talked to them about, well, if I just remove the things that are not good in your diet, you're still left with a pretty poor diet. It might not have negative impacts as much, but they're still nutritionally deficient. And so we have to look at the things that we can do that are going to provide the benefit that's necessary. And that kind yeah, of uh, ties in with that. Now, 
interesting enough, I would imagine when working with athletes, these, these often I find that athletes tend to be very driven. You know, they're very focused on their goal, quite often type A style personalities. And when you're working with these people, it's quite often, as you mentioned earlier, you give them advice and most of the time they're going to go and do that because they're mm-hmm. so focused on their objective. But in relation to diet and exercise, how do you know whether it's right to stick rigidly with a particular plan of action when the client's struggling with that plan versus maybe trying to adjust or alter the plan to try and find a better route or a more successful route to the desired goal? How would you, you know, weigh those two things up and, and, and come to a decision? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And unfortunately, I, I can't give you the exact answer because that, that's something I think I'm still trying to figure out. And I think more so it's because of the focus on that high performance, right? When you're in the locker rooms, when you're on the field, when you're in the weight room, and, and I do some volunteer work at the university I'm at now, but mm-hmm. you're working with a coaching team, they're only going to demand the best, right? You don't want to hear your, your head football coach say, hey, just, you know, just do the best you can, but that's okay, right? Like, you know, most of the time we played on sides, mm-hmm. most of the time uh, you gave great effort. And so when you try and balance that with, a, a high demanding type A championship, you only give your best with the approach of nutrition, where this is a much more long term approach. It's a little bit more forgiving. And essentially, we want to keep them swinging the axe instead of going all out, right? And so, right. this is a conversation I have uh, with our coaching staff all the time is, you know, what is most important right now? Is it a 100% effort all the time, every time? And if so, uh, what do we need to do from a supportive staff that we are to to allow this to happen? But we also know that they're not going to keep that up for long. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it's it's discussing to have about, we're not talking about mediocrity. We're not talking about being average. And, and like we talked about earlier, we, we are naturally negatively biased on looking for all the things that are wrong. Mm-hmm. And uh, I haven't exactly gotten there, but to go back to, you know, when do we adjust course? I think great coaches are naturally and they should be adjusting course at all times, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you look at programming for high performance, you can sit on September 1 and craft 52 weeks of this is the perfect plan. And all of a sudden, you're 20 weeks in and you're supposed to have a high load at a high intensity with maximum effort. And then you lost the game before. Maybe the, coach, the, the athlete got ripped by the coaching staff. Is that still the best plan? Mm-hmm. And so I laugh when I meet with my younger coaches and they're like, well, yeah, I wrote my plan out and this is what we're going to do. Every plan is flexible. There is no such thing as linear periodization. Everything is going to adjust accordingly. And that is what nutrition coaching is in itself, right? You may say, hey, you know, this plan, et cetera, the macros we have or the behaviors that we're looking to accomplish, that's going to result in one to two pounds or, you know, half to one kilogram of body weight loss per week eventually. And then now what do we do? And so that's going to take discussion with your coach. That's going to uh, maybe take an inventory. And that might be, hey, let's just take a little break right now and, and, and reset and let's look at where we are in life. And so uh, they're going to be very driven. They are going to be uh, very constructive in their own criticism. So I think it's, it's a balance of understanding, hey, what do they want to do? And how can I help and support them? Because there is some danger in changing all the time as well. And I've seen that with, let's say, uh, athlete weighs in and they're five pounds over and they're like, what did it? And I said, hey, give it a couple days, right? Like maybe it's a sodium issue. Maybe it's a hydration issue, especially if they're traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's a stress issue. Let's stay the course for one to two more weeks and then we can make a decision. And that, that's what drives a lot of what we call outcome-based decision-making at Precision Nutrition is what is the outcome? Uh, what are we going to do with that data? And how are we going to move forward? And for some situations, it's stay the course a little bit longer. For other situations, it's okay, what's the one thing that we can change here? And then let's reevaluate that. Every, everything to us is, is test, retest, and gather some data to accomplish the decision making moving ahead. Yeah, I like that. I like the, the, the implication there that you can periodize performance nutrition. You know, I don't think uh, anyone who's involved in personal training, strength conditioning, coaching of any description has any doubt that there's a need for a periodized training approach. There's a need mm-hmm. to adjust and adapt our training so that we don't overload and overtrain our client and to ensure we can optimize performance. But often when it comes to nutrition, we tend to think we have to get it all right at the start. This is the parameters and you have to stick to this all the time without any change. How might you go about sort of creating or developing that sort of periodized nutrition plan? 
So I, I want to take an inventory of obviously what they're doing well with, what are the situations that maybe cause these issues. So for instance, we know that, you know, most of our clients do well with schedules, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say Monday through Friday, we, we're at work, we're at school, our kids are doing certain things. Everything is pretty regimented. And then come Friday after school or Friday after work, it is like the, the gates open. <laughs> There is lack of structure, right? Now there are football games and soccer games, and now there's maybe dance recitals to go to. Maybe they're traveling, they're on the road. And so I'm going to, again, go back to, hey, what are the things we're doing really well throughout the week? How can we make that happen over the weekend? And, and, and that might very well be it, right? So if, if we were to, to make it a numbers game, and let's just say, you know, we love our clients to do well most of the time, and, and we put a number on that, let's say that's 80%, okay? instead of having this this 20 percent buffer zone of maybe less than optimal choices and we're kind of periodically putting them in throughout the week if we know that the weekends are going to be hard and crazy you know what are the structures what are the schedules what are the systems we can put in play mm -hmm. to either a allow us to enjoy these this freedom right to, to go to a dinner after church to to go to a tailgate uh to just let loose a little bit but also understand that hey on the next one we're right back on it and so I'm going to take some time to maybe it might be a periodization plan within the week, right? It might be within the day itself. Okay. So, Cause we know that overall caloric balance is what's going to drive the changes that they're looking for. Who am I to say that you need to have five meals a day? Who am I to say that you need to have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner and two snacks? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that person does better with two meals a day with a little bit larger food. Maybe that person does do well with an intermittent fasting routine because it, it's, it's less decisions to make. Mm -hmm. and, or maybe a person does well with a 24 hour fast because guess what? Not worrying about what to eat, what to prep, what to shop for, how to cut it, how to chop it, how to store it. Those are a lot of decisions. And for a specific person, they might be like, great, come Monday morning. I know there's one thing I don't have to worry about and that's eating. Right. And I'm not advocating that's a, a good way of doing things, but it, it, it takes it, some consideration of understanding where the clients are in their journey, what is important to them and how we can facilitate that support to help them get a little bit closer to their goals. I like that. I really like that. Uh, now you've um, mentioned there a number of things with regards to schedule and, and talking about all of the various decisions that people have to make. And I wonder if you could explain what habit stacking is and how you might use this to help improve your progress towards a goal. Yeah. So habit stacking is, is something we, we talk a little bit about in our, our level two certification program at PN, but it was, it's a concept that's been really popularized by the creator, uh, Dr. BJ Fogg, who comes out of Stanford and his behavior science research. And, and most recently, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits. And I have found great success with this, not only in my own life, but with a lot of the youth athletes I work with. And essentially it comes down to how we can use momentum from one easy thing, one tiny habit, one tiny action to catapult action into another action and so mm -hmm. forth. So I, I use the metaphor of like dominoes, right? If, if I align the dominoes in the right sequence, in the right space, and I push one, it's essentially going to knock down a whole, much, uh, a whole other sequence of, of dominoes. And so essentially you create a statement, right? So um, I think James Clear talks about it's an implementation intention. Essentially, it comes down to after or before this happens, then I will do that. And so an example that I use for myself is I don't do very well with taking vitamins and supplements and fish oils and creatine and anything, like that, even though I know the value of them. But I've just I see them They're They're put on, you know, my vitamin shelf above the refrigerator. or They're over here or I get into bed and I realize oh, I forgot again. Oh, I'll just mm -hmm. do it again tomorrow. And, but I do know what I do every day and that's brush my teeth. And I do that multiple times per day. And so an easy habit stack for me is when I brush, after I brush my teeth, I will take my multivitamin or I will take my fish oil because where did I put that? I put them now next to the sink where I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And so that's one easy way of stacking a habit that I want to build on a habit that is already successful. Mm -hmm. And so I start putting in these if then statements throughout the day. All of these things that I have a hard time doing consistently are now hinged on the trigger before that. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I wake up, I know that you know the first three to four things I do every morning, I get up, I brush my teeth, I go to the bathroom, I put my contacts in or glasses on and I make coffee. All right, if I know that as a consistent set routine, what are some of the other things that I'd like to do? Maybe that's to journal, right? So now after I have my coffee, 
I now write one to two or three things I'm grateful for, or I check my schedule for the day, mm -hmm. or I start my deep work for the day. And so it's, it's an interesting way of just saying, how can I use the cues of what's happening around me? How does that satisfy the craving I'm looking for? What is going to be my response to that? And how is that reward effect on how that moved forward? So again, it's not going to work with every habit, right? You can't just start all of a sudden, I'm going to start exercising five days a week for 30 minutes a pop. But I've recently added a, a 10 minute walk to after I make my coffee. And so mm -hmm. that's just part of the routine now. And so if I can continue to build on that and stack a habit on top of another habit, you're going to be pretty surprised with yourself on what you can get accomplished just by adding a little extra piece to that domino sequence. I think that's a really great, uh, a really great concept. I think it's also probably a concept that many people maybe do in a negative way without realizing it, that when certain things happen, for example, at the end of a long day, they're tired, sit down on the couch. And in that position, I've set in motion behavioral practices that I do all mm -hmm. the time. Oh, I need this snack or I need this, whatever. And, and or I'm going to sit in my phone for hours on end. You know, these kind of bad habits are often, like you said, they're, they're habits stacked one upon another. So using the same concept, really, but doing it in a positive way uh, to, to sort of lead into the natural habits that follow one another. I, I really like that. And, and to, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because that's, that's exactly what happens. And, and that's what we want to work with our clients of, you know, this is a constant in your day, right? So maybe you take the, the overworked client that is constantly going to stop at fast food on the way home. Mm -hmm. Or we know that alcohol is a trigger for a lot of our clients, right? Yeah. And so if they know they're going to go out and have a couple of drinks or they know that they're uh, susceptible to stopping at fast food, we now challenge them to saying, okay, if you know you're going to go out and you know alcohol is going to cause you to stop and get something to eat or come home and binge, hey, can you prepare something ahead of time, right? Uh, or can you have something in the car so then when you get back, you're ready to go? Or can you simply find a new way home? And so I'm glad you call that out because yeah, that's exactly what happens, right? Uh, and that's why we're always going to talk about, hey, wipe the slate clean, move forward. But you, we want to talk about that Friday night, oh, work is over, the week's done, I'm so stressed, let me curl up and watch some Netflix or let me go out. <laughs> that Friday binge session with buddies in the happy hour turns into Saturday morning brunch, which then turns into watching the games on Saturday, going out again Saturday night. And then what happens for most of our clients, we wake up Sunday and we say, ah, I'll start again on Monday. Like exactly. make the whole today, weekend's going. Today your Monday. Make the next meal your Monday. You know, don't put so much focus on that because Friday through Sunday, over the to over the course of a entire month, is going to be over a third of the month gone based on destructive habits. So yeah. I, again, I appreciate you calling that out because it's very powerful in either direction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now we're, we're kind of coming up on time, Adam, but I wonder if there's anything else uh, that you would like to share with us. Uh, maybe some, some things that Precision Nutrition are doing right now that are exciting or that people could get involved with that you'd like to share before we uh, wrap this talk up. It's been fascinating. Yeah. Well, I, I will say this. I've, I've had a good time this morning. I'm, I'm glad we were able to link up and I'm, I'm hoping the, the viewers are still with us at this time. But, you know, obviously I'd be remiss not to mention that you know, Precision Nutrition is the, the largest online nutrition coaching certification and software company in the world. And we are right in the midst of a, a new launch of a redesign of our level one certification, our version 4.0. And if you are struggling with clients, if you are struggling to get results, if you are looking to enhance the success of your coaching practice and the fulfillment that you have in this industry, I can't recommend it enough. I have seen it from the ground level. I, I took it, you know, when it first came out many years ago, uh, constantly through the process of rewriting and revising, but understanding what is available to you and, and having a resource like that is a gold standard to not only just teach you about the science of nutrition, there are textbooks and textbooks on top of the library that can help you with that. But how do you communicate with your clients? How can you maximize that relationship so that it's not just a one-time thing, it's an all-time thing? And so I do encourage everybody to check out our resources online as well as the immense amount of free resources we have, but also to challenge you as uh, an instructor, as a personal trainer, as a coach, to, to talk less and ask more. And, and, I, and I borrow this from a book that we recently reviewed, The Coaching Habit, but you know, our advice is not as good as we think it is. And I think we rush to fix things because we think our clients are broken, which they're not. We rush to sue things. We rush to save the day. But there is inherent value in letting our clients sit with some discomfort and work with them throughout this process. And so, you know, if we can just take a back seat and let them, you know, take the steering wheel, 
for once in this process, it will be amazing on what comes up uh, through their own behaviors, through their own thoughts, through their own feelings, because we want this, again, to be a transformation. We don't want this to simply just be another transaction. So uh, hopefully that helps. That was a little all over the place, but check us out. Uh, incredible resources, incredible experts, as well as understanding that uh, this is a very special situation that we have found ourselves in. Cherish it because it's something truly remarkable. Yeah, and I can certainly second that to the listeners. Uh, uh, I've used Precision Nutrition's website for, for, for many, many years now to get their opinion on various position statements uh, as well. A great resource and uh, certainly we'll link up the Precision Nutrition Level 1 course for anybody who might be interested uh, in looking at your resources. So Adam, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and we've had a, a pretty fascinating journey in this last half an hour or so. Right back at you, Ben. Thanks again so much. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share via social media. You can also rate the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, then check out our range of online courses at www.nordicfitnesseducation.com.